Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today are Louis D'Souza and Anne-Marie Young. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. In fact, not only are we so happy to have you join us today, we're happy to be on at all. Because this has been like, this has been like the tech nightmare for the last 20 minutes trying to get this to work. But we finally got there, and that's the good news. So we, we actually have our return visitor from last week. Maria has uh, come back, very graciously been able to come back and talk to us some more, which I really wanted to have happen because Maria, of course, is from South Africa, and our own Louis de Souza was born and raised in South Africa. And, I mean, you can't do the show unless you got the two South Africans on the show at the same time. So Louis, meet Maria. Maria, meet Louis. How are you doing, Maria? I'm very good, Likewise. thanks. That pronunci- pronunciation of my surname gave you away. You must be South African, even though you de Sosa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> South African de Sosa. <laughs> oh, there are many of them. You're not the only one. There are many of them. Millions, yeah. <laughs> And of course, uh, Anne Marie is also uh, on the show, and, and she's not from South Africa. She's from the UK, but you know that's okay. I'm only from the US, so the two of us will just kind of be quiet here. But I wanted to meet you two, <laughs> acquainted with each other. So Anne Marie, meet Maria. Maria, nice lovely to meet you. You <laughs> too. <clears throat> Maria, obviously, they weren't able to join us last week and talk about uh, what we were talking about. Um, I don't want to obviously replay the whole show, but just can you give them like a very, 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 very brief view of the life of <laughs> Maria, particularly in the last few years, that what you've been doing to, because we, we, we went through kind of the crash and burn stage, but then we talked a bit about how you've been coming out. Talk about a little bit about how you've been coming out. Uh, what I've been doing is when I lost everything, I decided they said robots going to take our jobs. And I have always been interested in trading. So I decided to see how I can use trading and robots together to make us passive income. Um, Long story short, being through all the scams that you can have, learning how to get scammed in any way, I ended up finding real projects as, well, like I said, to to, uh, vault, 99.9% of those are scams. So at least I started finding the real one after doing DD. I watched them for a while. Then I test them myself. I don't market them at all. And then um, I always, I was always looking for hundred percent passive. That's what, that was what makes it really difficult because you don't find hundred percent passive. When somebody tells you something is hundred percent passive, you're already wary. But I've started finding them. And I'm now testing most of them, and some of them I've been testing for a year, two years. So I'm in a very lucky place to have found them. And I just decided the day that I do find them, I will help other people who need passive income as well. I told uh, Walt I've got this funny combination. I always wanted to be an artist since before I went to school. And so life happened and I never did it. So I decided second half of my life, I want to be a full-time artist, market online, earn passive income with robots and trading and travel. And while I do that, I'll help people that cross my way. Which is an a laudable ad, um, ambition, to say the least. <laughs> By the way, there's something, Maria, I got to tell you. We, we did a lot of talking last week about the various scams that you've encountered. <laughs> And, of course, in true law of attraction fashion, the following day, I found myself busting two scams that came my way. So I just had to tell you, the law of attraction is playing. It is doing a very, very good job. Uh, one came you online, one came offline. Stop talking about them. I'm telling you. I mean, <laughs> and, and the best part is one came online, one came offline, and they came within five minutes of each other. I mean, I just thought it was really, really wild. So, yeah. So we're going to stop talking about scams for the rest of the show today. <laughs> so let's just talk about a million pounds then, please. <laughs> oh, all right, all right, all right. I think they are hearing us, Walt. They are hearing us. And then all, everything works together to come to us. It does. It really does. Algorithms, yeah. algorithms, law of attraction, everything. So, Maria, say Afrikaans of Engels. <laughs> yeah, buyer is a, is a mix, yeah? 
Ja, ja, wat ek eindelijk het, ek soetoe gepraat, voor ek Afrikaans gepraat het. Soetoe? Soetoe? Yes, wow. en toe het ek leer Swazi en Zulu praat. Ah. Maar eindelijk, eindelijk is ek een soetoe, ek is nie Afrikaans. Prachtig, ek geloof het nie. En jy, en jy hoor maar so lekker brei ek? Jy hoor maar so brei ek in Afrikaans? Ja, Mm. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if you have no clue what we now say. <laughs> no! Well, I was hoping we could have just listened to you, but I didn't expect not to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I just said to Maria that they're laughing at us. Ah, <laughs> uh, we were. <laughs> it, was nice. it was lovely. It was lovely to watch. <laughs> he, 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 he was telling me what you were saying about me before the show started. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> it was nice. It was nice. <laughs> I believe yeah, you. Yeah, you lift, Suddenly, I feel like we're in trouble. I don't know why. <laughs> I know. I feel like a <laughs> naughty child. <laughs> Oh, that was a good one, Maria. Uh, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maria, Lu- Maria was Lu- telling Lu- me Lu- that Lu- she was speaking a black African language before she could speak English. Oh, really? Before she could speak Afrikaans, yeah. Interesting. You will actually hear, in English you don't hear it, but because I can roll my R's, but mm. in Afrikaans I can't say the R. And that is mm. because the black language I learned to speak first doesn't have an R, they've got a it's a mm. sound. So I say the same for Afrikaans for an R, and nobody could ever teach me to, to fix it. <laughs> so, so, so that feel a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot to feel better about. <laughs> <laughs> so where were you born, Maria? In the Free State, small town of Excelsior. Excelsior, okay. Because I was in yes. Tempe in Bloom for two years okay. in the army. Okay, mm. Tempe is two kilometers from me. Who I'm yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. City of Roses. Not many roses left, but it's still City no. of Roses. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like New Haven, Connecticut. It's the Elm City, but there are no elm trees left. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have uh, to figure it out. We know why. No yes. figuring it out. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Maria disease, comes from a part of a part of the country that is very, very flat, mm. where the wind blows through, where it's very hot in summer and very cold in winter. <laughs> and it's just a weird. And you get sandstorms. So you get these huge sandstorms coming across, then it rains, and then everything is covered in mud. It's weird. It's quite weird. This mm. afternoon was exactly that. And was yesterday. it? Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. I didn't know whether we could have connection. Yesterday it was the same thing. And then it stops in the rain and then the sun shines. And then you have to clean everything. Every window, everything is muddy. Everything. everything. And the yeah. cars. All yeah, the, the cars car, needs to be washed. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm a real farm girl from a free state farm. Grew up on a farm. So Maria, I'm I'm, I'm curious. Um, what, what do you know? Where have you learned, or what are you a law of attraction? Mm. I I really have to think now. I think it was during my hard times when the book came out. I saw it, and the secret came out. Mm-hmm. I think it was about the time it came out that I saw it. And it just came to me. As you know, you go to a bookshop and books come to you. You don't search they, for them. They jump out, they, of, the, they, out of the bookshop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and while I was living um, in Gordon's Bay, there was this oh, nice Gordon's book Bay. Mm, Got a story about that. Nice, <laughs> yes. So there's many stories about Gordon's yeah. Bay. <laughs> <laughs> there are. <laughs> So um, there was this little bookshop who's got all these um, spiritual books and call it weird books mm-hmm. for, for small towns. So, mm-hmm. And it wasn't during that time that I wasn't working. So mm-hmm. I spent most of my time reading. So what was it about the law of attraction that grabbed you? I'm curious. 
everybody's kind of at different angles of what, what really drew them to it. For me, it was um, the fact that you could do whatever you want and achieve uh-huh. whatever you want by just using your mind. Mm-hmm. Whether it's health, wealth, whatever mm-hmm. you want, mm-hmm. a relationship, and that you can do it with your mind. Before that, when I was really ill, and the uh, pain medication didn't work. They taught me self-hypnosis to control my pain. So mm-hmm. it kind of flowed out of that, I think, realizing if I can control pain with my mind mm-hmm. and vi- visions and dreaming and imagination, then if you can dream it, you can get it. You can make it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what Abram Hicks says, isn't it? If you dream it, you can make it. Yeah. But you can't just dream it. You have to do something as well. It's like praying. You can't just sit and pray. You have to do something. <laughs> but you have to see it first, think it first, see it first, mm-hmm. speak it, and then do something. Then it will come to fruition. Not always when mm-hmm. we want it, and not in the time that we want it, but it will. If you just if you just persist, it will. Cool, cool. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you was in connection mm. with cryptocurrency. Are, are you crypto mining or what are you doing there? Um, no, more trading. Right, trading. trading okay. Portion okay. holding and uh, holding and a portion trading. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the main thing is like most of these things, it's mainly you are learning. Not mm-hmm. really doing any of those. You're just learning. <laughs> there is mining, but the mining is also, it's most of it is also scams. You have to find the real mining. And at this stage, mm-hmm. it's easier to do staking inside the platforms mm-hmm. rather than mining. It's safer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if you can call crypto safe, I mean, most people won't call crypto safe in the first <laughs> I don't often hear those but, two words in the same sentence, so I understand yeah. that, yes. <laughs> but if Gambling you are, if is you are already, <laughs> um, I see Forex more as gambling. I've started with Forex. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can do, what I like about crypto is that someone can really start with 10 or $50. And if they've, if you've got the right system, like most things, internet marketing, summits, um, trading, whatever it is, if you have the right systems and the right person to follow, mm-hmm. you're going to get there. Then you must mm-hmm. just learn and persist and do it and practice it. I actually have a very nice system. It's called iQuin Pro, which is a micro profit system that mm-hmm. teaches people to make small micro profits. And they've got people mm-hmm. that were waiters and really they started with ten and fifty dollars. Yeah, but yeah. that system teaches them consistently how to make small profits. But that's not yeah, about yeah. holding at all. That's all about micro profit trading <coughs> and helping people. Well, that, but it's an it's an amazing system. I've never seen a system like that because normally if you train 10 traders and you put them in front of the monitors, everybody does their own thing. While if you go through that system and if you follow what that system teaches you, they more or less do the same thing and they get more or less the same results, which is something that you don't find in any trading. Mm -hmm. Maria, sorry, can I just ask, I know nothing about crypto. <laughs> Can you just give me a quick overview of it, please? There's no such thing as a quick overview. Quick overview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you know about crypto? <clears throat> Literally nothing. It's something I was thinking okay. about the other day that I, that I wanted to learn about, so it's quite nice that you're on the show. Okay, the easiest I've seen a few people mention it. it if you're holding a dollar, is mm-hmm. that, let's say, a hundred dollar bill, is that piece of paper that you're holding, is it worth a hundred dollars? Definitely not. No. <laughs> so it's a perception. It's what you believe. Mm-hmm. Crypto is exactly the same. 
it's just not a paper one. It's on the blockchain and it's a technology. But it's exactly That's, the same thing. It's a so perception. It's in, it's, it's in the, in the cloud. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly the same. There's no difference between fiat money, the dollars and the euros that we use, and crypto. Yeah. Except okay. the advantages. <clears throat> Anne-Marie, just to give you an idea, one country has now changed its currency to Ecuador. I think it's it? Ecuador. Ecuador yeah. Yeah. It's changed its currency. So, in other words, it might have had dollars or pounds. It's changed it to crypto, to Bitcoin. Okay. So, in other words, and I saw a second when one the whole world now. gets that. Yeah, There's a second yeah, one? Be, yeah, mm. I heard about I that. I saw it today. Well. Mm. The reality so, is fiat is totally going to disappear and quicker than people realize. They don't realize how quick it's going to disappear. Sorry, what's going to disappear? I missed what you said. Was uh, fiat, uh, fiat money, fiat she money. says. Fiat yeah. What, what's that word you use? Fiat. Yes, fiat. Fiat. Yeah, all your dollars and euros and paper. So, so paper anyways. money. Paper money. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of, okay. I've no. never heard that word before. That's a new one. Yes, like in fiat, like the car, they call it fiat. Yeah, money. yeah. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Different meaning, but same <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I can tell you why. It's, it's called fiat money because it's money that has been declared money by authorities, that, by fiat. So that's why it's called fiat money. Uh, okay. Doing is, um, for instance, the robot that I use, the one that I'm showing people to help them change their lives currently, is exactly for somebody like you. Because it's three steps. I show you how to open a crypto wallet. Now, your crypto wallet is exactly the same as a bank account. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. It's just a crypto. It's called a crypto wallet. Yeah. And you've got a long number. And that long number, your wallet address, is the same as an account number. So I teach the person to open that account. I show them how to buy crypto from their local currency, transfer it to the project. The robot does everything, and you withdraw and bring it back to your account so that they don't have to learn to trade and all those things because trading is not for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So my, my aim is to make it as simple as possible for the every person on the street who would like to try it and not having it that scary because when I did it, I had no clue what I was doing. I had to test and figure it out myself. So every time you press that button, whether it's an, on the banking side or in your wallet side, you don't know if you're doing it correctly and if we, whether your money is going to come in on the other, other end. So it was yeah. real stressful. I'm not even talking about the projects. I mean, if you press the button and it goes to the projects, you don't know if you scammed or whether it's going to come. And that's why I decided to help people so that they don't have to go through that scary um, phase and facts. And especially if they've been scammed, it's even worse. I, yeah. I, I said to Walt, I think I'm too stupid. That's why I keep doing it. <laughs> 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 I don't learn. I keep testing the ones that I want to test. <laughs> So, Maria, I have another question for you. you. I heard, I think, from Walt that you had fibromyalgia. Or do you still have it? Yes, I, I still have it. Okay. Yes, I've got uh, fibromyalgia, age? myofascial pain syndrome, Tietze syndrome, and I've got markers of ankylosing spondylitis in my blood, but I don't think I've got the symptoms. I disagree mm -hmm. with the doctors. I say I don't have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you've had to deal with a lot of health issues. How have you managed that? Um, in the beginning, when I was, oh, it took me five years where I went from specialist to specialist, where they didn't know what's wrong with me, and they told me it's all in, the, in my head. And I said, you don't know what's wrong, and it's not all in my head, so I will find it. So long story short, after five years, I found a professor who told me, this is what's wrong with you. This is what we're going to do. And the first thing he told me was, let no, let no one tell you it's in your head. And it's actually, at the moment, it's really scary. There's already now a condition called COVID fibro. I don't know if you know it. Mm -mm. Yes. They, they're calling it already this long-haul uh, COVID. 
has got the, exactly yeah. the same symptoms as fibromyalgia. And they call it now COVID fiber. And what happens is, um, it, you're, in my case, it was triggered by glandular fever, but it's often a virus that triggers it in your system. So mm-hmm. this virus is triggering it in all these people's systems. And now they're sitting with it. And it's going to become a very big problem. It already is. Um, but in the beginning, when I didn't know what was wrong, I overworked. Then I would have more pain, and I would work to get my mind off the pain, and it snowballed until I burned mm-hmm. out. So, and, but at that stage already, I started reading. There wasn't internet at that stage, so I started reading Dr. De Martini's books and uh, books that I could find on fiber. There were one or two available. And then I started testing and searching myself and doing the mind thing, learning what's the mind-body connection. Um, In the end, I think you learn by mistake and testing if nobody knows. I mean, until today they tell you they don't know what causes it and there's no cure. And I believe Mm -hmm. they're wrong. I really believe they're wrong. There is a cure. But you're going to have to have a holistic, balanced life. And you're going to, I, for instance, believe if I lived and my whole life as an artist and a creator, I probably would not have developed it. And if I developed it, it would never got that bad. But if you're not in congruent doing what your highest values, who you are, what you are, being in the relationship that you want to in the job. And I mean, things happen in life and you have to do things that you have to do. But if you have the knowledge from the start to live a congruent life, I can almost guarantee you that these things won't happen. I would agree with you. Um, you, you will still be playing with contrast, but it'll mm-hmm. be a different contrast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You will go out of balance and you will feel mm. it and you will go back. You'll be able to go back much quicker. The scale. Yeah. Yes. Now I've got to try and see if I can reverse what I've done in 30 years. But mm. I believe I can because in my 20s and 30s, I worked in macadamia factories. I designed macadamia factories and managed and trained people. Mm-hmm. And during that time I when I burned nuts. out. I love them. Mm. They are. They are they. Um, during that time, I've overworked and I totally burned out. So at, if I would, on a scale, look at how much better I am than at that time, I would say I'm a thousand percent better. But I'm still not in a good state. So mm-hmm. I believe, um, I believe I'm gonna, I'm gonna change it. But like I said to Walt, what happened to me every time I wanted to, after I've lost everything, and I got a job again. Every time I want to do something about my health, I got stuck. I don't have enough U.S. dollars. I don't have U.S. dollars. And it wasn't ranked. It kept pushing me to I don't have enough USD. Doesn't matter what I wanted to do. All the list of things I want to do is on my computer. But if I want to do it, it's U.S. dollars. And it's only 100 and only 500 and only 1,500. And sometimes it's, an, it's your annual pay. So Mm -hmm. I decided, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to be a full-time artist. I want to earn passively with trading and robots and stuff. I want to travel the world. I want to heal myself, but the dollars is stopping me. Mm -hmm. So I decided to start by finding a way to make dollars. I mean, the people around me at that stage, I told them I just want one dollar. And they couldn't understand. They said, what do you want to do with one dollar? I said, if I know how to earn one dollar from where I am, I can earn Mm. more. And that's how it started. But like I say, it's been scams and this algorithm bringing them to me. And I think it was part of the bigger picture, having to learn how they all work. Mm -hmm. And they will still catch us. It's not going to stop. I mean, they evolve all the time and they become very sophisticated. So they can still catch me. It's still happening, even if you know so much. So where are you living now? I'm curious. I'm in Bloemfontein. 
Oh, you're in Bloom. Like I say, yeah, two, two kilometers from Tempe, literally, near the university. So where I learned to gun drive and command a tank, she lives two k's away. <laughs> <laughs> I've done the same, but not at Tempe. I did it there. Yeah, at, yeah. <laughs> when I was at school still. <laughs> are, are you near the Brug anywhere? No, no. But I, I did that at the Brug. When I was in grade in standard six, which, which we called standard six. You remember we mm. had to go I to I remember camps. standard six to ten, yes. yeah. <laughs> we did those yeah. camps, so I there I also learned to do what you were doing, uh, but not at the scale that you did it at ten. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> but Felt, just Felt a week. School, yeah. No, that's not child school. That was no, okay. cadets or something. Uh, okay. Yeah, felt school was something else. But then yeah, I loved, I I've been I've been a real tomboy since I was a small small child. So I loved felt school. So 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 just to enlighten the others, felt school is uh, when you're at school, they take you out of school for a week and they they put you through some basic army training, um, and then they send you back to school, boys and girls. <laughs> Uh, there, I presume there's a point to that, right? I don't know. They never told us what the point was. <laughs> <laughs> we just we were all supposed, we were Did you go back to different people? We were all supposed to um, defend ourselves against uh, the enemy, I suppose. Ah. <laughs> Did they ever figure out who that was? Yes, they, they were the well, communists. So we oh, did yeah. quite well, Louis. <laughs> <laughs> so, I forgot about the communists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were the big enemy coming down from the north of Africa. Yeah. Mm. And now we are the now we are the communists. Now we are the communists. <laughs> <laughs> so, now we will have to fight ourselves. We lost. We lost. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, it's complicated for anybody to understand South Africa who hasn't been there. It's really complicated. <laughs> but very interesting. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. Very diverse. <laughs> yeah. I kept thinking when she was telling me her story last week, Louie, uh, about her health issues in particular, how you had also been through health issues and, and learning your own way through asking the same kinds of questions that she was asking and so forth. I mm -hmm. thought, wow, you know, that, that would be a conversation there somewhere in there because you guys have both traveled really remarkable trails. Um, let me give uh, Maria a little bit of an overview. So I was uh, a sick kid uh, and I had asthma, but they kept on feeding me antibiotics and not a inhaler for some reason or other. But I, um, I was pumped with antibiotics as a kid and I remember how bad it was when one day uh, in the morning my sister slept in the bed in the same room as me and she, and I was doing this all night I was going oh, 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 oh. <sighs> just trying to get a full breath um, <clears throat> and by the time you get and, and up in the morning you're so exhausted Exactly. But my, my, my sister said to me, she said, you know, Louis, I'm so surprised you're not dead. <laughs> and that's what made me aware that, you know, this was actually something really serious. I was just trying to breathe. I wasn't thinking <laughs> of it was serious or not. <laughs> um, so that, that, um, enlightened me to that aspect. And then my mom had reflexology books and, you know, as a 10 year old boy taking my hands and massaging them and taking my feet and massaging them and, starting to that find relief and, and, and working through, you know, all different types of things. I was already quite advanced with yoga, but I didn't even, I wasn't ever taught officially. I could do things and still can that most people can't, um, even the yoga teachers. Um, <laughs> and That's normally so, what happens when we do it ourselves. We do things that they don't know how we do it. <laughs> That's why you taught true. yourself. <laughs> So over the years, I've become very, very confident in my health. And um, I jokingly say to Walt um, all the time that I enjoy being sick because I do. I've got so many tools in my, in my arsenal that um, the contrast of being sick to getting myself better is, is a great little challenge for me. You know what to do when you get enjoy. sick. 
Yeah, I know exactly what to do and how to do it and what to do and which modality to go to and which area to focus on, etc. It's very, it's pretty easy for me. Um, you know, I've been trying to get COVID ever since it came out, but I just can't manage it. <laughs> 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 it's like, you want that natural immunity. Yeah, I want the natural immunity. Absolutely. I know I can handle it. <laughs> But, there aren't um, many shows where you hear somebody say they want COVID. I just want to put it out there. It's <laughs> unusual. Um, but I was you do, thinking you do the same thing. I'd rather go through that. But they're still going to force you to vaccine because it's not, <laughs> it doesn't give you such a good immunity. I want to go back to South Africa because you guys don't really have the money to afford it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got bad news for you. Eh? I've got bad what, news for you. They're going to force the individuals to pay for it. Good luck. Oh, Good they, luck. that's old news. <laughs> but they, they, <laughs> they, they do mandatory Good luck. <laughs> they doing mandatory vaccinations now. Yeah, who's paying for it? Our medical aids. Your medical aid. You don't, medical if you don't aid, have a medical you don't have aid. One. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't have one, the government pays for it. Serious. Where's the government getting the money from? They're bankrupt. They can't even make electricity work in that country. <laughs> Don't even go there. I, I, I won't vault. I won't vault. And it's only going to get worse. That's the worst. Oh. It's really unbelievable. They don't even have Yeah, you just can't believe it in all the years no, they've had. They can't fix that electricity problem. Oh. It just blows my mind. <laughs> There's no parts to fix machinery. There's nothing. There's nothing left. Mm -hmm. People are, people are learning now from overseas what um, load shedding means. I mean, because our South Africans will say, listen, we've got load shedding in 10 minutes. We've got to finish this. Then they ask, so what does that mean? Shedding. What's going to happen? <laughs> so the world is know. learning what does load shedding mean. <laughs> it means that they turn the electricity off in that area and then give it to another area so that they can have electricity and so they shed it around the place. So you so all have electricity, but not all the time. time. <laughs> not last week is what last week it was four <laughs> hours a day. Mm. Two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. Can you imagine not having electricity for at least four hours or for two to four <laughs> hours a day? <laughs> if it was during the working day, I'd be quite happy. <laughs> 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 no, remember, you still got to catch up. So tonight you've got to catch up. <laughs> yeah. You've got to work in the evenings when there's electricity. Yeah, it's, Crazy. It's, it's it's tricky for a country like South Africa. I mean, it had it. Yeah, you still have to do business and get things going and get things done. Mm. So, but that's just the way it is. But on the other side, I think it makes us innovative. Absolutely, absolutely. And, we, and South Africa's always been very good at that. All the sanctions, yeah, etc. Unfortunately, we have a very good sense of humour. Yes, it's also <laughs> valuable. <laughs> we make a joke of anything. <laughs> That's a strength, actually. That's really a strength to be able to do that, because what you're really saying is in the face of, of great adversity, you found a way to smile at it and not let it get to you. Mm. That's I power. think I was it still kind surprised. of happens automatically, or you grow up like that, and the people around you do it, so you grow up doing the same thing. Joking mm -hmm. about things that other people would think, gee, that's horrific. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it's Maria, a way I'll, of I'll, handling it. I'll tell everybody a bit of an effect of South Africa, because at the age of 27, I came to live in England. And every time I went to the to withdraw money from the, the, the machine in the wall, um, I used to look around, who's looking, who's looking, <laughs> you know, cover my cover my keypad and all the rest of it. And, you know, that didn't go away for a long time. Somebody was walking behind me in the streets. I couldn't let them out. You would look. And then I had walked, you know. Um, and it's, it's very difficult for anybody to understand mm. the kind of level of awareness that you have to uh, and, and life that you kind of live in in South Africa and you've been brought up with. It's, it's you know, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just part of it. And the it is a, you know, so you don't, I, for instance, when I go to the I central didn't even know it existed, Maria, until I came here. And then I saw you know, the I realized that Nobody else is looking at who, who's, when they were drawing money. <laughs> when I was Nobody else is bothered if they were, somebody's walking behind somebody. I, 
I was on my way to Australia via Singapore. And mm -hmm. that night at 11 o'clock, I was walking around in little China or somewhere. And it was the weirdest feeling I could feel. I had no reason to look behind me. I felt safe with no reason. I was a woman walking at around 11 o'clock at night. Mm. And, and that, that actually made me realize. But the, but the funny thing was I was at one of these temples. Now, I wear a size 8 shoe. And I was wearing these white cream boots. They looked like ships. <laughs> And I took them off when I went into the temple and put them next to the others. And I thought to myself, what do I do if they steal my shoes? And I've got to go on my, on the plane barefoot. And I looked at them and I thought, no, I don't think they're going to fit anybody, even if somebody would, would steal shoes. <laughs> but you just have that mindset. I mean, I cannot you imagine putting my shoes down there in all these rows. and then, But you, then you realize, I mean, everybody's shoes is there. Nobody will steal them. And fortunately, mm. looking at mine, they would go skiing with them or something because all the other <laughs> shoes were these tiny little things. You, you know, Maria, every that's time where I, I experienced my, it. Uh, every time I came back to my car when I went shopping or left at a, at a mall or whatever, I, I used to wonder when I was coming back, is it going to be broken into? Is my radio going to be stolen again? You know, is, oh, is, is my car going to be gone? Is going to be there? <laughs> <laughs> Every single time. It was like, ooh, like, let's flip a coin. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's very sad, like you, when you move, to get out of that, you realize under how much Stress, exactly. you live without even realizing being aware of it completely unaware of it mm -hmm. yeah. you live under that stress constantly i mean and in my in my house in my area on your health yeah exactly uh, an underlying yeah. um but if you start living with source energy and realizing that everything's on loan mm -hmm. to you in any case and you start saying you know <clears throat> whatever I need will come to me and you start really living that to the core. That's what South Africa can really teach you because the law in Africa is different to the law in Europe. In Europe, it's live and let live. In Africa, it's kill and be killed. <laughs> and it's a very it's different strongest. law to live by. <laughs> it's a very different law to live by. But there's a raw, um, there's a raw, earthed groundness to that which people who do go to Africa tend to love you know it's like mm -hmm. there's an honesty there's a level of absolute honesty that goes on with it all um, and no very little pretense like there is in the UK <laughs> pretense <laughs> everywhere <Yeah. laughs> yes that's the other side of it hey so you but know I there's pros say, and you know, cons to the whole thing I want to ask you something. Uh, when I went to Australia, I was there for three weeks. Now, I'm away. I'm used to being away from my family and everything. But during that three weeks, something in me missed Africa. Mm -hmm. Something about South Africa. There was a yearning, and it was mm. only three weeks. Do you yep. still have it? You still get it? It's a long answer to this. So when I was at boarding school in, I was born in Barberton. Do you know who that is? Never yes, heard. I lived in Barberton and Nell's Street and White what? River. What? It whole local. I put up all those <laughs> macadamia factories. So, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So you know where Barberton is. So yes. I was going to boarding hmm. school in Nell's Street and Which one? Every um, oh, local time. One? Oh, yes. The only English they school in the exist. local. Yeah, it still exists. At that stage. There, not so. At yeah, that stage, so it was, the only it was a white school, at, a white English school at mm. that stage. It was the only white English school in the whole area by mile, you know, forever. Um, so um, I was traveling with my sister and I was at boarding school there and I, I hated going to boarding school. So I loved my weekends. I loved home um, in the mountains. Um, we lived outside Barberton and on the trip. I was, my, I had this huge knot in my stomach and I felt terrible every time I went back to school. And then one day I was sitting in the car and I said, stuff this. I just want to be happy wherever I am. And something happened inside me and instantly 
I was happy where I was. And from that day forward, it doesn't matter where I am, what country, where I'm flying, whatever I live, I've been happy where I am. So a long story short, um, mm. I love going to Africa. I thoroughly enjoy it, any part really. Um, but there is a contentness of wherever I am now. So wherever I lay my hat is going to be my home, and I don't care where it is. Mars, That's what I told Walt last week. I said to him, it's a decision you make. Mm. I said, I want to travel the world just with a backpack. I don't even want to have a suitcase. Just my laptop, my backpack. We'll come to a country, I'll buy the clothes I need. I'll just go mm. there with the basics that I have to have. When I leave the country, I'll give it away and I'll buy the next clothes in Absolutely. the next country. Yeah. And wherever I am, I do what's, what's in front of me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, yeah. The, the modern life in the Western world, there is the problem <laughs> of, mm, how do I put it? Things. Laziness and boredom and, and, you know, just being too content where you're at, you know, not even content is actually a level of discontentment with it, the whole thing. So, you know, we were, I, I always like finding ways of, of putting myself on the edge, you know, even if it's in driving my electric scooter and <laughs> in, in the streets or <laughs> doing anything. Go to India with I, your scooter. Yeah. Go to India with your scooter. <laughs> Uh, um, you know, just, just doing anything as dangerous, walking barefoot all the time, you know, as much as I can, uh, uh, temperature wise. So you're going to come fire walking with me. Oh, that's easy. That's nothing. Oh, that's a... You've done <laughs> it. Walk in the park. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear I've found a partner who wants to jump out of planes and walk barefoot on. Oh yeah. And... I've done all that. <laughs> Scuba diving. Oh, nice. and skydiving. <laughs> Oh, I've, I've done too. a lot have of the checks on my bucket list already. <laughs> no, I still have too many I want to do. I just, yeah, I'm just no. waiting for my child to be out of school. I said to Walt, when she's out of school, then I can start jumping out of planes and off cliffs and stuff again. Mm. <laughs> mm. Doesn't matter if you're dead later on after she's out of school. Yeah, as, as long as she's yeah. sorted. <laughs> <laughs> I th have you seen? Have you seen those squirrel shoots, uh, uh, suits that they jump with now? It's like flying. Yes, yes, I want yes, to yes, yes. That's on my. Yeah. That's high on my list. On the bucket one. list. Yeah. That's high. <laughs> Very on high on the bucket yeah. list. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think that's the closest that we're ever going to come to feel what it's like to fly. So you want to jump out of a helicopter, ski down a hill until you get to a steep cliff where you go onto the. Uh, onto this, this, use the suit, and then you hit the parachute, and then you land. Yeah, well, that sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, you need to be in the next James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> not, not That's the awesome. <laughs> I, I, t I told my daughter, I think I'm going to be the first grandma who's going to roller skate in the old age home. Not that I think I'm going to get to the old age home, but. <laughs> Grab the electric scooter, it's a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds boring. No, no. You have to fall a few times. <laughs> That's not a cool fall meme on the today. Electric scooters. <laughs> I saw a cool meme today. It was a 95-year-old German woman who was a gymnast, and she was doing gymnastics ah. in this video. It was fabulous to watch. She was, she's in yeah. great health, great shape. Yeah, so why not? Um, roller skating seems calm by comparison, so... I watched them. There's that one, and there's another one who's a ballerina at 96 mm -hmm. and something. Yeah. Or there's wow. another one of 100 and something. I, said, yeah. well, I just need to start my yoga again, otherwise I'm not going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to do yoga if you want to get there. <laughs> no, but it's uh, well, I, hmm? Yes, Anne-Marie? I was, I was just going to say, I did roller skating last year. I got my roller skates out, and my neighbours started moving their cars out the street. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you haven't practiced for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> they're, they're not so worried about people grabbing the money as they're at the ATM. They're much more worried about somebody whacking the car with the roller skates as they go by. You have to understand what the priorities are. <laughs> no, I must say, I, I said it's actually a very nice place to be. 
it, it sounds very strange to people, but it is so nice having lost everything. Absolutely. I, I even lost mm. our photos. I used to take many pictures. And not to my own doing, but I lost them three times in my lifetime. And I kind of even not bothered to take many pictures even. Mm. And it's the brain does a good enough said, job. What's supposed yeah, to be forgotten so, is forgotten and what's supposed to be remembered is remembered. Exactly. And somebody mm. said to me, What are you scared of? And I said, there's only one thing that I'm scared of that I wouldn't be able to handle. But I mean, if I'm there, I'll have to handle it. I can't imagine my daughter disappear. And I don't know where she mm -hmm. is. And she's one of these prostitution houses or something. But other than that, anything can come your way. So you don't stress about small things. If you lose your photos again, you've done it, you've done it before. So just another one and you learn from it this is a you know, fascinating conversation to hear the two of you talking because you're both talking from a perspective of having lived in south africa and of of coming out of that experience with a perception of life that basically says well after that hey this is easy <laughs> that's really that's really what it sounds like you know <laughs> After, you, after you've been through all that craziness, the rest of it just seems easy by comparison is what it sounds like. But, Walt, there's people in your backyard that go through crazy. Oh, I'm sure that's true. I'm just I'm describing what yeah. I'm hearing from you two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's lots of crazy around here. I live in the U.S. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you think I don't know what's going on? Come on. <laughs> The other thing I experienced when I was about, let's say, 30 was when I was that ill. And at that time, that professor that treated me, I said to him, I don't want cars. I don't want fancy houses. I just want my health. That's all I want. Don't want money, nothing. When you haven't got it, that is things. it. Yes, yeah. I don't want things. And he said to me, you reached at 30 a level that some people never reach, but most people only reach when they're 60 to 80. So I don't have any attachment to things. I give mm. things away all the time. If I don't, don't use something, I give it away. Or well, I throw it away if I mm -hmm. can't give it away. Absolutely. And I've got no attachment to whether it's clothes or things around me. It's only the dog. But you do have one attachment. Family and my daughter. Yeah. They will always be. My daughter is mm. definitely. And I, I can't, I can't put the cat and dog aside because they, they like children. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is actually one of the connection we all have is that internal connection, but that mm. one I don't think ever goes away. Yeah, that's always the. We're very good at hiding it from ourselves. I, I have, I spent years doing that. We think, and in the process of ourselves. doing that. Well, I did it pretty successfully. I didn't know it was there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, you know what? When I when I put my mind to doing something, I want to do it well, <laughs> and then that includes well, hiding you couldn't see myself my own connection. <laughs> you couldn't see and touch it. It didn't exist. Hey? It didn't exist. That's right. It was it gone. Exist. It never existed in the first place. That's the way it felt. Absolutely. <laughs> but it's interesting. One has to be careful what you say to people. For instance. Um, when I'm that honest and raw and straightforward about what happened and everything, not everybody can handle it. it it's quite mm. interesting. For instance, let oh, me take true. an example. Um, in 2015, when my late husband passed away, I had 28 rand, which is $2 in my pocket. No job because I couldn't keep a job and look after him. And I didn't earn enough so that I could pay somebody to look after him. So I looked after him myself. And the day he passed away, I had 28 rand in my pocket, $2, no job, no funeral policy, nothing. Didn't know where the next money and the job was going to come from. And I literally, the only option I had was to donate his body to the university because I couldn't bury him. 
And I mean, many people cannot handle it when I tell them. They can handle the fact that I didn't have the money and I couldn't bury him, but I often have to take out that part where I say, I donated him to the university for research because I couldn't bury him. But it's all things that taught me that even those things are also not important. And at that stage, it was practical because his sister in South Africa, they were not in connect, they not connected at that stage. And his other sister and mother was in, um, was overseas in um, Pennsylvania. So there was actually nobody to have a funeral for because we just moved here. His friends was far. They wouldn't come. Mm -hmm. So it would be literally my daughter, my brother and I. Sure. So mm -hmm. it didn't make sense. Right. But I mean, um, I, I also find that people handle total honesty and openness and things as they are very difficult. But I see it as their problem, not mine. Absolutely. <laughs> it is a nail on the head. <laughs> so I say it, if they can't handle it, then it's their Us problem. Us unfeeling, not mine. terrible people, that's how we believe. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but it, but it's I mean, a valid things, way of looking at things. Those things also teaches you other things. Mm hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think everything we go through in life is to teach us to be better human beings. So, Maria, when you can be detached from your family and your daughter, that's when you become the master. Um, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> She's asleep. <laughs> Checking the <for sure. laughs> <laughs> It's, I, I've never said this to anybody, but there is kind of a detachment. I don't know mm -hmm. how, I, I love her to pieces, mm -hmm. but there's not, she's attached to me, but there's mm -hmm. not this attachment when she's away and visiting a friend and sleeping over mm -hmm. that I'm looking for all the time and mm -hmm. I want her and I need her. I don't have that. But so, with, before, before I fell pregnant as well, I've never been broody. Mm -hmm. It was a decision. I wanted her and, and, and. But I've mm -hmm. never been broody and I wanted the baby and could she, could she type all the time? It's not me. So, um, so I've always so, done also what I think is right for her, not mm -hmm. just because I love her. Yeah. So there's a, there's a level of spiritual clarity that, that that looks at love in a very different way after a while there's a lot of love in giving your daughter space to be at her friends and not worry about her etc etc and you start appreciating that to a far higher degree than oh what's she doing where is she i need to make sure she's safe and you know all that kind of stuff so you you start learning that level of detachment even with your own children you know? mm. No, it's I'm funny to hear you guys describing it. this. When, when you describe it this way, it, it, it makes me realize something about myself, which is for years and years, I was very, I was a very confused person, particularly in my youth. Very, very confused. And as I look back now, I, I understand why I was confused. Mm -hmm. It's because the state of mind that you guys are describing was the one that seemed normal to me. Mm -hmm. And I was surrounded by people and everybody who was, it was not everybody normal. Else didn't. Nobody understands. Right. So, so I, I felt and like I were, was the one who was out of step. But you were. <laughs> Which you I, were. Well, I definitely was. There's no <laughs> doubt in my mind at all. I was totally, completely out of step. <laughs> Something I actually find very difficult is I raise my daughter with these things from very young, two, three years old. I mean, she used to go with me with a bookshop and I teach her what I think. But I say, you've got to think and find your own way. Mm -hmm. And from a very young age, she would, in primary school, she would say to me, Ma, I speak to the children, but it looks as if I'm talking a different language. They don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually felt sorry for her because it was the thing that you're talking about now. She is so different that they don't understand what she's saying. But what I also is, have come a, to realize is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Louis. There is a place where you can get to where you can have your cake and eat it. 
In other words, you can you can be that spiritual aligned person who is different to everybody else and accept everybody else for being different as well and mm. just have fun with it all, you know. It, it doesn't have to be a mutually exclusive thing at all. But they just they sometimes don't understand you, so mm. they don't understand your words or what you are saying. But needing or wanting anybody mm. to understand you is, is a waste mm. of time and effort. And exactly. <laughs> So that's why we learning don't do that is, a, is, 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 is a powerful place to get to, you know. A lot of people don't necessarily like what I say or do, et cetera. And, you know, somebody walked out in the sauna of me the other day. Louis <laughs> 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 <Lui's> sauna <laughs> is well known here on the show. The, the Louis, uh, Louis, <laughs> Louis sauna is his office. It is, yes. <laughs> So, well, it's a um, good place. So, so the guy actually came back and he apologized twice to me. Ooh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which was very interesting because I didn't have any feeling towards it. You know, if somebody gets angry with me, it's their business. And you didn't expect we, him to apologize. I, I didn't just, expect it. Was, I had no it just idea. Was. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I can explain the whole thing, but it'll, <laughs> it'll take a while. I was thinking we'll do it in one of the other shows, but, um, there, there was another guy I was chatting to there, and we were having such a good conversation, really good, and I can explain what I mean by good later, but um, that he went to the middle step on the, on, on the sauna, and I went to the middle step, and then we both landed up on the floor to continue our chat. <laughs> so we were on the floor of the sauna, <laughs> so we could last longer before we had to leave. And then I was telling two other girls about this, and then they were chatting to me, and they loved it as well so much that so we both, all three of us, landed up on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's it, it's really fun when when you can get a lot of people together and share ideas and have fun like that. It's, it's and just good. allow people to be who they are, not exactly. trying to force what you think exactly. onto them and giving exactly. you your opinion. And telling mm -hmm. you your opinion by just listening yeah. and watching yeah. them and their reactions. But, and but not only and, and giving my own opinion as well, but not expecting them or needing them or wanting sure. them to believe or agree exactly. with it at all. Yeah, quite happy yeah. to share. Yeah. There's, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon that I've been noticing in my life. Uh, I don't go to a sauna, so I can't really tie it in that way. But um, <laughs> I, the, the phenomenon that I notice, and maybe it's because I do a podcast, but it's, it's also because... I think this is just the way things are going. The the viewpoint we've been describing here, this lit and live, live and let live, this, you know, I'm not going to be worried about how you're reacting kind of attitude. Yes, it was completely foreign to the way things were when I was growing up. Today, people, when I encounter people who I would normally have assumed would not be willing to pay attention to it or give any credence to it or accept it in any way, they're listening. Mm -hmm. They're listening to it now. They're paying, and, and they're, they're demonstrating, I don't even have to be talking to them. I could be, you know, seeing, seeing them in a park or seeing something on television or whatever. People are all of a sudden opening up to it in ways that when I was, you know, in my twenties, I would have thought was impossible. And now it's just kind of happening. So I, I have this feeling that deep down, everybody really wants what it is that we're talking about, but mm. we have not allowed ourselves to trust that we can actually have it, that we won't get shot down by somebody if we try to espouse it. And, and as that, that, um, pattern continues to unravel and to un unroll, so to speak, I think we're going to see more and more of it. More and more people are going to say, yes, that's for me. Yes, that's what I want. Yes, that's what I like. But there is that mm -hmm. awakening because more and more people are connecting as well because of the internet. That's true. That helps as well. So people Absolutely. connect all over the world. And there is that awakening. I think everybody is tired of the industrial age and things and speed and unhappiness. Everybody's looking for real and authentic and what is instead of mm -hmm. what's supposed to be and having this image of things. And isn't that a lovely thing? This has been a great visit, Maria. Thank you so much for coming back again. I'm really glad to see you and Louis going at it like that. That was great. I mean, I, I, I don't think guys. you found more than three things to disagree on. It was crazy, but I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> we will find something. We have to disagree Absolutely. on something. Absolutely. You just have to come to <laughs> five episodes. That's all. You know, eventually you'll find something. You know. <laughs> I make my own. 
Oh, I nice. Yeah, <laughs> I just bought some when I went He's to London yesterday. Grew up on a Actually, farm, I was in London. So. I was London watching the Lion King um, musical, and I've never seen London so busy. Literally, the, the whole Oxford Street was absolutely jammed. Absolutely jammed. But I mean, you have all people. the products now. So you have, you have Mrs. Balls, and you've got Biltong, and you've got everything. In They're the not allowed to import it anymore because of South COVID. African shop. Oh, because yeah, of now I went to the South African shop, and suddenly he was saying they're not allowed to import all the stuff. I said, have you got some ostrich Biltong, which is jerky for you Americans, um, dried meat. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Which I don't uh, eat, by the way. I just had to say. And, and they said they couldn't import, they couldn't import the ostrich built on, but yeah. In South Africa, if a kid can have built on coffee with bread, then they grown up. Then you don't have to worry yeah. about them anymore. <laughs> I love that. I've never heard that before. <laughs> You've never heard of it? No. no. If you're a farm child, Life, and right you face, right knee, sunny skies, sunny skies and Chevrolet, yeah. <laughs> Coffee, bread, the, and biltong, then you shop. <laughs> That's another South time, African so. one. Then you shop. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish we had another hour. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> you can always but do it offline. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Or well, we could have you back another time. That would be another idea. But seriously, no, though, thank you for coming to join us. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate all of your stories. And, and uh, I loved hearing you guys compare notes on South Africa. I even liked it when I didn't understand it. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time. You're on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody.